Hey guys, <clears throat> Tommy here from Simachain. I want to talk to you real quick about the progression of Web 1 to Web 3. You know, we hear a lot about it, um, and, and sometimes it's kind of hard for us to put this into perspective, especially if we haven't lived through those generations. So if you're my age, maybe you've had the opportunity to do that, but if you're a little bit younger, uh, or if maybe you just didn't pay attention because it wasn't of, of focus to you back then, uh, then maybe this will be of help to you. So what I want to do is this is a course that we have at Simba uh, for our functional users. Um, and uh, in, in part of that course, we, we cover this, this, uh, this topic. And so I want to kind of go through this with you and kind of talk about how this has is, is happened over the years and, and what it is that we're looking at here. So, you know, when we think about the progression of the Internet, um, it's just the Internet, first of all, is just the infrastructure uh, of all the wires and everything that connects all these networks and allows us to intercommunicate, right? So, so it provides world intercommunication, the, the internet. It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's the ability for us to network across uh, the, the, the wires that have been made available using standardized protocols. And those are just the rules for communication. So Web 1 was the um, data that was placed using those standards right on these these connectivity wires uh, and in order to host those resources it was very expensive um, and so you can think about web one as you know very pioneerish right it was hard to use it was expensive um, and even when you think about from a user standpoint if you were a user and you had to use this technology, it was more of a destination point for you. It wasn't a place um, that was ubiquitous. It wasn't just readily available in your pocket like your phone is, where you can get online and ask a question on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever you decide to use. But it was a destination point. For me, I had to go in the, in the military, I had to go to my squadron, the Marine Corps. So I had to go to the squadron to get uh, on the network in order to provide access to those resources. <clears throat> and most of those resources that I was reading, it was just that. It was just read-only. There wasn't much ability for me to be a, a document creator uh, unless I owned my own server and or I had the technical acumen to be able to create those resources right so 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 there's a lot there's a lot involved here so when we think of the internet um, as the first rendition or the web one as the first rendition of of this is is it was very hard to use and it was very hard to consume and so just like any technology technology must be what we call normalized and, and, and normalized and also democratized. And so let's talk about both of those. Normalization of the technology means that it's not easy to use. You know, let's look at the automobile. This is something that's probably much easier for us to understand as a, as a, as a student. But, you know, when the automobile was first introduced, you know, had, to, had two flag waivers in New York uh, and, and a mechanic in case the thing broke down, right, uh, to be able to drive the contraption on such uh, busy streets not to interfere with the horses, right? So uh, that um, also, you know, even if you think about the pushback from social uh, realms, you know, we, we saw in that same time one of the biggest pushbacks for the automobile in big metropolitan areas was the horse manure shovelers uh, um, um, guild right or their uh, their you know, their organization their their um, their union right so the the horse manures union uh, was able to kind of give pushback on the ability to to normalize the the technology that obviously was was better so so things as simple as shoveling horse manure can become a problem uh, when you start to think of uh, normalization of technology in a social aspect. So, so there's a lot of different things that, to look at here, but generally speaking, it's tough, right? Even though it was good tech, a lot of times you gotta have to ram good tech down the throat of society, right, before they'll actually normalize it. So that's something that we saw with Web1. And another thing too, you know, that I kind of mentioned is, is it was, um, it was expensive, right? And, and so, 
you know, it just it just wasn't it wasn't practical. So you know that also affected normalization. Okay, and so that expense uh, is also going to affect our ability to make something um, democratized or available to the masses. If it's not economically sound for the masses to consume it, then we will need to take a different approach, right? We, we need to somehow make, make that model cheaper for most to be able to access it. Okay. So that's that's what we're talking about there with decentralization, or excuse me, with um, democratization and normalization. So when we look at the the Web two rendition of Web one, what that did is it provided some of the things that we just talked about. It democratized the technology, made it much easier for most people to use. They didn't have to be a computer programmer or own a server or have a server room uh, in order to have a web presence. Uh, they could actually just set one up on Facebook. They could set one up on um, on Wix. They could set one up on um, whatever their favorite hosting platform is and begin to even have an e-commerce site. They could start to sell things. They could start to be uh, their own publisher. Uh, for videos, right, and become a video blogger. And so the technology in and of itself um, had been democratized, right? And so we started to see platforms like Facebook, like LinkedIn, like YouTube, uh, that started to then um, actually disrupt uh, what was being done in traditional senses with, um, with software, uh, for things like video publishing, for things like um, uh, resume uh, hosting, right? And so, you know, LinkedIn's kind of taken that away, right? You think about um, uh, classified ads in the newspaper, that's been taken over by Craigslist, right? So, so technology in and of itself with Web2 has provided uh, a space for us to easily adapt these re these these hard to use tools uh, and make them easy to use. It's been democratized and normalized, but in return we paid a price with Web two, and that is centralization. And when we think about centralization, um, centralization is centralization of power. You know, we are allowing these platforms to have the power to make decisions that could affect lots and lots of users because of the nature of a platform, right? So what we need to probably do is build protocols instead of platforms. And we'll talk more about that as we kind of go through this class. But, you know, if you think about this, it really doesn't matter which side of the fence you are on with that particular point there with that picture. Um, you know, if the platform has the ability to silence a, an elected nation state official, um, especially of a free nation state like the United States, then there's a, probably inherently a problem with that centralization of power and it needs to be addressed. And so that's where Web3 and decentralization uh, a lot of times uh, starts to become the future or the way that most will focus on how they think the web is progressing. And so when we think of um, the term the semantic web, that was that was first coined by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and I'll talk a little bit about him, but he was the gentleman that created um, um, basically DNS and the ability for us to link uh, through uh, DNS names, different documents and namespaces, and sort of create this web of, of data. Um, and so very much um, responsible for the internet. And so um, <clears throat> he actually coined the term the semantic web Make, meaning that the, the internet should be uh, be aimed at being more autonomous or self-governed 
um, and, and, and open and, and available for everyone and intelligent, able to be able to provide you know, intelligent decisions and things like that. And so that data needed to be interconnected, but in a decentralized way and not centralizing power like what we see a lot of times with some of these different platforms. Um, and so these centralized repositories have created a situation in Web2 where the power has been concentrated more in the platform and so to counter the centralization of, a pl of power, blockchains could be used to decentralize some of these and maybe turn some of this into protocols instead of, of, of platforms. And so Web3 uses these technologies um, like blockchain uh, in order to allow decentralization and create more transparency into the security of, of those computing elements. And so what it does is it leverages um, um, digital signatures and cryptography and, uh, and digital hashing. So we can have things like non-repudiation and, and provenance and ownership of a, of a digital claim or a digital scarcity and a digital asset. So digital scarcity and, and non-repudiation and those types of things, those may seem a little foreign to you. We'll talk about those as we kind of go through class. Uh, but those were things we couldn't get in a traditional computing sense because you could always just copy something. You know, if you remember Napster, that's a great example where digital scarcity was able to really disrupt an entire industry. They were able to leverage the ability to take a digital copy of um, an asset and then turn that into uh, another uh, perfect version of that asset, thereby eliminating the value that that asset may have inherently. So, so if we can uh, make that asset digitally scarce so we know that it can be copied uh, and provide a level of hardness to it, uh, then that can that can do a lot of incredible things. And that's, in essence, what a blockchain did, uh, Bitcoin, that was kind of the, the spark that uh, really kind of gave us this great capabilities in Web3. And it gave us the ability to have this transactional data in this decentralized ledger that was very transparent and everybody could just see so they could, we could all have visibility and know uh, what's happened. And so therefore we, you know, it, it's just, it just is uh, as far as transactional state is concerned. And so with that, it's starting to give us a pathway to uh, more uh, data sovereignty and self-sovereignty uh, um, and, having, and having ownership of data and then who profits from that data. Um, so Web3's protocols is going to enable us to kind of interconnect a lot of this and it gives us the ability to have more ownership of those digital assets instead of the assets being owned by the platforms where they're being hosted. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. One of the things that I like to uses an analogy to explain this is we can think of this as similar to the light bulb, right? And I like this this picture here because Web3 provides the features and the functionality that previous versions of the web just wanted to do, but they just couldn't. It just wasn't there. It didn't have the tools. Blockchain provides the tools and the features so that we can start to add in some of these value add propositions. So we can start to have things like ownership, of our digital data. We can start to have self-sovereign identities and control that through our wallets, right? And so, you know, we can start to affect things like passwords and stuff. <clears throat> so, um, so the first blockchain that we saw, of course, was Bitcoin. It really kind of fixed this problem. You know, if you if you look at the history of, bit, of, of Bitcoin, uh, there was a lot of precursors to Bitcoin. I mean, uh, David Chom and and um, and hash cash and and Bitcoin and Bit Gold and um, Nick Zabo had a couple of a project and and, and there, there was a lot of, of of predecessors to the Bitcoin white paper. But what the Bitcoin white paper finally proved is it was a mesh up of a lot of these different technologies and a lot of these different ideas, and it came up with the ability for us to kind of. Um, uh, fix the double spend problem, what, what we have with digital scarcity, kind of what I mentioned with Napster. So if I can make an asset digitally scarce uh, from a ledger perspective, uh, then I can start to create a store of value through that digital collectible. 
So, um, so we'll talk a bit about that in this video. Uh, this is a great video to watch. Uh, this includes a video uh, by Joe Lubin, who's going to explain Web3 to you and his, his vision of Web3. Uh, there are also problems with Web3. Web3 is not just blockchain. Of course, Web3 is going to include other variables throughout the stack, things like AI in the middle tier, ubiquitous computing with, um, with our, uh, excuse me, virtual reality and, um, and, um, and um, 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 AR and VR alternate reality and virtual reality so uh, so both of those will be available to you um, at the at the front end right so we're attacking thumbs and screens basically there middle tier we're attacking um, the uh, the static algorithms right so the algorithm isn't static it's more dynamic based on some machine learning code or artificial intelligence right we're so, so between all of those, that's basically bringing together this Web3 model, uh, which will affect the entire stack. And so that's, that's that. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this section. There's a little uh, exercise here where you can kind of just drag and drop these cards and decide um, which version of Web you think this technology matches up with. Hope you've enjoyed this lecture, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks.